Um, but I want to talk to you about rock dust in forest soil. And uh, my goal is to get towards solid evidence and carbon credits. My name is Vitsus Gauten. I'm a forest owner. Uh, and I'll dive into that a little further later on. Uh, but first this, the obligatory uh, what if section of a Double Nature Talk presentation. What if we could add rock dust to forest soil and it was proven to heal and strengthen forest soils and trees? And what if it were to actively draw down lots of CO2? And what if it could be paid for from CO2 credits? Well, in that case, on the back of an envelope, you could apply, say, a common dosage of 10 tons per hectare. The EU alone contains 185 million hectares of forest, according to the EU. Um, so if one ton of olive vine uh, uh, binds around one ton of CO2, then that would mean that we could about one and a half gigatons of CO2 if we applied this stuff to all the forests in Europe. But of course, there's a big question mark on that because a lot of people are working on it and there's numbers coming from calculations but we don't have scientific proof yet. And that's where I really wanna help us get. And some stepping stones to get there is to quantify drawdown for different rock types. How much will it actually draw down in different situations like putting it into existing forests? We need to learn more about the effects on soil life because we can expect them to be good and we can see some experiments that are going well, but we need scientists who have rigorous method methods who can actively say, okay, we've done all the testing, and it's really true. And once we've done that, we need to figure out optimal grain size and the timing. And then we get to organize carbon credits and we can make it all happen. Okay, so I said I was a forest owner. Now, this is the story for that. It begins at Terhorsen Co, um, which is a textile factory in the east of the Netherlands, or it used to be in the 19th and 20th century. It went bust in 1982. And it produced burlap, which in Dutch is called uh, jute which are the, the pretty bags that coffee beans come in when you go into a coffee shop. This factory was located in Reise in the east of the country. And in the late 19th century, the owners started collecting land nearby Reise. And they were investing in it. And that was something that was pretty common back then. The landscape looked uh, a lot like much of Scotland, really. A lot of heath. Uh, overgrazing was uh, something that had been going on for centuries. And the only thing that you could really do with it was uh, either graze sheep on it or uh, plant Scots pine, which is Hovden, which is a tree that doesn't need a lot of nutrients. And so that's what they did. And that was about 50 hectares. This is one of the directors and his wife. They got married in 1914. And these are my great grandparents. Sometime around this time, uh, the ownership of all those 50 hectares passed from the factory to the family. When they were married for 12 and a half years, uh, he bought her, or he, he, yeah, he had this little uh, prefab Swedish cottage built in the forest. Uh, and this is my personal emotional connection to the forest, because this is where we always go for weekends, and where I have been going for weekends since I was born, almost. Uh, and that's not just me, that's a lot of family members who feel the same way about it, including especially my mother. And current management looks like this. Uh, this is me and my mother. I've chosen a kind of a sentimental photo because she died last October, but she was really um, the heart and soul of, of us doing something about that forest. That's my aunt and my cousin and my other cousin, and me and my cousins are currently the one, ones that make the decisions about the forest. But we're also a member of a, a cooperative of small forest owners, which is called Bosgruppen, and they actually help us do the things like organize harvests and uh, plant new trees uh, at larger scale and deal with regulations. So what does the forest look like? Well, this is two pictures. The top one is the happy picture, which is what you see when you look outside from, uh, from the cottage that you just saw. Uh, and a lot of the forest really looks like this, or, or pretty enough anyway. Uh, but we do have a few sections that are already being affected by climate change today, or actually in 2018. So the bottom section is Omorica spruce, which is a species that is not native to the Netherlands. It's, it's supposed to be in mountains, but it was planted because it was a good timber tree. Unfortunately, it doesn't like hot summers. So in 2018, they all died at once. And um, well, another, a few other of the species like beech, which is native to our country are also suffering. The last few summers, they have been shedding uh, their leaves partly, which is a really bad sign. Um, so we've tried to get to 
regenerative forestry in the last few decades. My parents' generations decided to start mixing species and ages through selective harvest, so only picking individual trees or little groups of trees instead of cutting down whole sections. And they got us uh, certified for uh, FSC, Forestry Stewardship Council, in 95 or around that time. In 2010, uh, from then onwards, we started adding small numbers of new tree species, just to be sure that we, whatever climate we get into in the couple, next couple of decades, we'll have either this species flourishing or that species flourishing, and not have one forest of one species that happens to be uh, the bad luck one. Last year, we um, were part of a pilot for CO2 compensation organized by FSC, where they planted new uh, fast-growing trees in existing forests. So that's what happened with us. And carbon credits were created for that and sold to a nearby company that wanted to compensate. This year, we're going to have a new harvest, probably in, in autumn. Uh, what we're doing is we're going to designate fixed harvester trails, because what happens when uh, a harvest happens in your forest is big machines come in and they roll around and they have to to reach the trees, to pile them up and to, to draw them out of the forest. But while they do that, they flatten the surface, they flatten the soil, and they basically kill a lot of life in the soil. And that takes decades to recover. So what we do by this is basically 10% of the, of the land will be permanently designated as trail and will be permanently ridden across. And the rest, the, the other 90% will be free of machines. Possibly in the future, it's still an ambition. We want to debark in the forest because the bark contains a lot of the nutrients in a tree. And it's not particularly useful to the sawmills that actually have to remove it uh, later on. So why not remove it in the forest and spray it around where the tree was cut? I also always wondered about this odd red soil in one of the paths. It was just one place. And I've been wondering about it since I was a child. Looking, you know, Why is there gravel here? Why is this like a tennis court? Uh, it's hard to see, perhaps, on this presentation, or for me, it is on this screen. Uh, but the soil that you see on the right is much redder than it than you would expect in, in a forest like ours. And the, the grass is much greener than you would expect at the side of a road in our forest. But when I inspected this a year ago, I think, I noticed that it was the red stuff is basically ground brick. There was a brick factory close by, and paths like this were semi-hardened with brick rubble. So... That brings us to rock dust, which is not that dissimilar. Rock dust is already being used in forests in the Netherlands for purposes, because our forests have been planted on the poorest soils in the country, the places where farmers decided we can't farm here. Uh, and those soils are really, what do I say, they're vulnerable to nitrogen and acidification, uh, and they will cause the nutrients to leak away. Now you might ask, why not just add fertilizer to your forest? Well, regular fertilizers like they use in agriculture are counterproductive. They're counterproductive in regular agriculture, but when you use it in a, in a forest, you will get a sugar spike. So the trees and, and the soil life will grow um, fast for a short while, then they'll crash, and then you'll have more death instead of more life in your forest. So you can't really fertilize your forest unless you keep doing it every year, every year, every year. Uh, and that's just too expensive. So nature needs a kind of slow release kind of fertilizer, which is what rock dust is. It's already being researched here by scientists at Wageningen University. The Hoge Veluwe, which is a national park, has uh, a couple of sections, uh, a number of sections really, where um, one kilogram of Eiffel gold per square meter has been distributed. And Eiffel gold is, is a kind of rock dust. It's calcium based, I think. So it's a little different from olivine. But the essence is the same. And the goal for this experiment is to halt and reverse the decline of oak uh, and some other species that are slowly disappearing from that habitat. Two years on, there's more life in the soil. And most, most importantly, there are no big imbalances. There's not one new species coming in. There's not one species dominating. It's the same plants, the same fungi. They're just doing better and the trees are, are healthier. So that's really good news. But this experiment does not address CO2. And the cost of this stuff, that's a big issue too. If we want to put one kilogram on uh, each square meter on 49 hectares, that means we need half a million kilograms of whatever rock meal we're gonna use. We need to buy that. And then we need to pay for moving it and we need to pay for spreading it. And we need to do that on our uh, forest's annual turnover of 7,000 euros. 
it's not going to happen. Then along came climate cleanup. It was very inspiring and it was really, I was, it was so nice to just be there in these lockdowns and, and log in and see all this positive news about things that are going well. And then there was this one um, uh, double nature talk and the Olivine conference last year that really sort of gave me this aha moment because Olivine is not much different from the, the stuff that's been used at Hochwelue. It's also crushed lava, just a different species, a different kind it has great CO2 drawdown potential. So I figured, what if we spread this stuff in our forest? And what about the rock dust that's already being used in places like Hochevelue? It might not be olivine, it might not have that big potential, but maybe it's also binding CO2 as we speak. We just need to know about it and we need to measure it. And if obviously as the forest, forest owner, this is the picture that I was hoping for, that we can make rock dust affordable for spreading in the in the in uh, in our forest by selling CO2 credits that represent what it produces. There are some reasons for caution. Eiffel Gold, the the rock dust being used in Hochevelue, can draw down only half as much CO2 as olivine if you base that on purely the the chemical aspects of it. And olivine itself contains significant traces of nickel, which is potentially a problem. Uh, a lot of people are worried about it and say that it's a big problem, but we don't really know it. So we need to know whether it is or whether it's not. If it is, yeah, high nickel concentrations can be harmful to soil life, but there are also some other arguments there. Also, olivine contains some not as much beneficial minerals as uh, some of the other rock meals. But there are some real reasons for optimism too. Forest soil air, the air inside the layer of forest soil, is full of CO2 because it's full of living and breathing creatures. The trees are the ones taking the CO2 out. They're converting it to sugar and that's being spent in the soil and converted back to CO2, almost the same amount. So that's a great place to have your olivine sitting around because it will react faster. Fungi actively weather rock dust using chemicals as well as mechanical force. And when olivine or other rock meals disintegrate, they also disintegrate into clay particles. Now, most of these forests like ours are based on sandy soils, which need clay because it keeps water, it retains water and nutrients. Also, some fungi can actually immobilize toxic elements. So it, even if nickel were to be at some kind of level that's not too good for your forest, there might be fungi that can actually fix that. Across Europe, uh, the species that I'm, that's shown in the right, the bottom right, Castagne bolete, chestnut bolete, is a species that you can eat, but you shouldn't be eating it every day because it collects the cesium that's been shed over Europe after the Chernobyl incident. So they're actually radioactive a little bit. They take that away from the soil in order to let the trees and the other life grow better. And healthier soil also means that the trees and soil life will grow faster and thus also increase their CO2 drawdown. So that sort of talking to Linda, talking, listening to you guys uh, uh, led to two ideas. One for the short term is a demonstration project, which I'm talking about with Paul right now. Uh, and it basically involves reinforcing some of the paths, the public paths in our forest with olivine. There are some weak spots. There are some places that could use a little bit of extra fortification. And if we put down some explanatory signs, some posts saying what's going on here, what is this stuff, why is it here, what does it do, that would be a great way of, of showing that this stuff isn't so, isn't so strange. And like the red stuff that I pointed out earlier, we could be monitoring the effect on the soil and plants near that piece of path. And even if it were so terrible, that wouldn't do much damage. If it were good, we could see the same strip of super green grass growing right there. Plan two is for the long term. That's the hard science. The goal here would be to establish specific and convincing evidence. My plan here would be to apply rock dust, whether it's Eiffel Gold or Olivine, or actually I'd rather do both. And I've just heard that basalt would also be a good one to add to the, uh, to the mix. Uh, and apply it to a few test sections with a few control sections nearby. With a goal this time of measuring and establishing a rate of CO2 sequestration because that's what we really want to prove. If you want to have credible carbon credits, you have to really believe that the carbon is going into the soil and staying there, and you want scientists to measure it. Where an additional goal for olivine would be to uh, look at the effects that it has on forest soil health, the same way that's happening at Hochevedu right now. 
but I don't have that company yet. I don't have the, the angels or anything. I'm just a, a, a guy with a forest. I moved one step away from zero, which is find a scientist. Uh, I'm talking with uh, Matilda Hagens at uh, Wageningen University right now, and we agree that this would, would be a good thing to do. And we're looking at steps two, three, uh, and four, which is getting funding and finding a PhD who will be doing the actual work and getting to do that for a number of years, and then eventually publish results. I'm also here a little bit to ask for help, or at least to see if there's, if, if there's help available. And there's three things that I want to focus on. First of all, finding funding and applying for them uh, for it is something that I've never done before. And it, when I look at the websites of the EU, uh, of the Dutch, Dutch government, it looks like it's an art form in itself, like something that you should be experienced at in order to actually succeed. So if there's anyone that can help uh, on that account, that would be really great. Secondly, I want to understand soil content norms because I want to know more about all that nickel stuff. I, I, the things that I read don't make 100% sense to me. And finally, very practically speaking, we want to put those signs in the forest next to the patch of olivine, whether it's the, the patch that's on the path or the patch that's being used for the science. So we need a good price on uh, signs for in the forest. Thank you very much. If there's any questions or suggestions, they're very welcome.